So as was shared, um, every Labor Day weekend, uh, we've traditionally had a prayer service where we enter into a time of intentional prayer. And so what we're going to do this morning is I'm going to uh, teach on prayer. We're going to learn about prayer uh, from the scripture. We're going to learn even how to pray, some practical things. We're going to share communion together, and then we are going to pray together corporately uh, as a body. And you can do that uh, silently, individually. You can do that as a family or as a group of friends or or just with whoever is in in proximity to you. So just so you know where we're headed this this morning together. Let's start by uh, uh, opening our Bibles and uh, looking at our passage that we want to look at today. This is from um, Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 13. If we could put that up. Can I get that monitor up just so I see what everyone else is seeing? Thanks. Luke 11, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend, And you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door's locked. My children are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he won't get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Reflecting back on Psalm 28, which was read at the start of the sermon, we read these words. To you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. Don't turn a deaf ear to me. For if you remain silent, I will be like those who go down to the pit. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help. Psalm 28 also begins with these affirmations. You are my rock. You are my foundation, my strength, my hope. And then, and then this cry, don't turn a deaf ear to me. My rock, my foundation, my strength, my hope, don't turn a deaf ear to me. Hear me. Don't ignore me. Why this desperate cry? Because he writes, If you remain silent, I will be like those who go down to the pit. If you don't hear me, I will die. It's a prayer of intense desperation. And maybe you are here this morning and you are in that space. God, if you don't do something, I am in deep trouble. Prayer is important. Prayer can save our lives. Prayer is a tool that we need to learn to use well. Jump into our passage now. So Jesus is praying in a certain place. And it's clear as we study the Gospels that Jesus prayed a lot. He took time to pray. We read about Jesus going off in the night and praying all night, spending night in prayer, going up in the morning and praying. Especially the Gospel of Luke shows us repeated instances of Jesus praying in various circumstances. And the disciples see all this. They see Jesus praying. And so one day they ask him, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray, Jesus. Context. Jewish men. Devout Jewish men who have been praying, who have been taught to pray since they were little children. 
they knew how to pray, but yet they see Jesus and they see there's something different about the way he prays. And they look at that and they say, I, I need that. We need that. There's something lacking. Maybe you can relate to that. You've grown up in the church. You've been praying your whole life. And yet you know that there is something more. There's something more that we can learn from Jesus today. So let's enter in with that posture to learn from Jesus. Verses 2 to 4 are the Lord's Prayer, likely the most repeated words in the English language. And then verses 5 to 13 is this very compact teaching of Jesus on prayer. Verses 5 to 10 is this interesting story about a, a person in need who goes at night to a friend's house asking for bread, friend for bread, and his friend gives this response. Don't bother me. The security system is on. Walk on my property. Cops will come. I'm in bed. My wife's in bed. Kids are in bed. Dog's in bed. We're not getting up. Leave. So I'm not sure how this constitutes a friend, but that's what Jesus calls him. And then Jesus says that in the end, he will supply the need. And the reason, and he says, it's not because of the friendship, but I love this line. Because of your shameless audacity. Because of your shameless audacity. Do you have shameless audacity in your prayers to God? Do you, do you have this confidence in standing before the King of Kings to make your requests known? I want to challenge us to be audacious before God, to pray audacious prayers, to pray big prayers, believing that we serve a big God. You know, I really, and I'm not just saying this, but I think we're on the verge of a tremendous outpouring of the Spirit of God in Canada. This past year working here at Ebenezer, I've seen something I haven't seen in over 30 years of ministry. I've seen every week, and this is not an exaggeration, every week we have people walking into this building every Sunday with no religious background, no faith background, and yet there's this deep hunger for truth and for reality. And this is happening all across Canada. And I think we're about to see some of the most exciting years of ministry in Canada and in our church, which I'm super excited about. But it's going to be partly dependent on the ability of God's people to have shameless audacity in our prayers before God. Verses 9 to 10 are some of the most hope-filled verses in the Bible. Ask, you will find. Seek, ask, and you will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, the door will be opened. Everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. Now, looking at these verses, what it tells us is that prayer is not a passive activity because these are all active verbs. These are all action words, asking, seeking, knocking. So let's look at this. How do we ask for things? Well, we need to be on proximity. If I want something from you, I have to come to you. I have to be close to you in communication with you. So in order to ask God, you need to come to him. Come to get him and ask. Now, how do we seek things? Well, we move. We take action. We move from place to place looking. When it comes to prayer, are you seeking God? Are you moving towards God? Are you reading his word? Are you praying with the Christian community? Knocking. When do we knock on doors? We knock on doors that are closed. It makes no sense to knock on open doors. So the question is, are you knocking on closed doors in your life? Closed doors can be things like a prodigal child, a strained marriage, impossible career job issues, medical challenges. You know, I believe life is a series of perpetually closed doors, and so God invites us in to knock on those closed doors. Asking, seeking, knocking. And then Jesus tells us that these are not futile exercises because he says everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be open. Now here I'm going to say something controversial. There is no such thing as unanswered prayer. Because 
if there were unanswered prayer, then what Jesus has just said here is not true. And I don't think we want to say that Jesus had said something not true. Because Jesus says, you ask for something, you receive it. You seek something, you find it. You knock a door and it will be opened. Now here's the rub. And this is something that will take our whole lives to come to peace with or come to terms with. And it's this. God's answers sometimes do not look like what we think they should look like. God's answers do not look like what we think those answers should be. The prophet Isaiah explains this dilemma the best, or explains why we have this dilemma. In Isaiah 55, 8 to 9, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So there's this great chasm between the mind of God and the mind of humanity. There's this great gulf between everything that God can see and everything that we can see. Because the truth is, is we all have really truncated, small perspectives on the world. We are limited by intellect, geography, culture, language. We're we're limited creatures. We are, in truth, children, and we don't know everything. So what happens in prayer is that prayer humbles us because you ask for something when you don't have it. You seek for something when you don't know where it is, and you knock because you can't get through something. And so prayer teaches us our limitations and the things that we don't have, and it teaches us that God is the ultimate supplier of all our needs. So as you ask, seek, and knock, your heart is being drawn closer to the heart of God. And this, I know when I'm saying these things, it's hard because we, many of us have prayed for things that have not good things that we thought were good. We've prayed for healing and people have died. We've, we've prayed for marriages to be restored and people have divorced. I went through a season of challenge around this area. Um, Some of you know the name Nabil Qureshi. Nabil was a Christian convert from Islam, a very gifted young man who uh, had a global platform, had written a a great book that could be used in Muslim evangelism. And then in the middle of all of this activity, he gets stomach cancer, very aggressive cancer. He has to stop ministry. He pursues aggressive treatments. Hundreds of thousands of dollars are raised to try experimental treatments. He went to charismatic churches seeking miraculous healing. And he raised up thousands of people all over the world to pray for a miracle for his healing. And I was one of those people. And he died at the age of 34, leaving behind a widowed wife and an orphan daughter. And that really rocked me because I was like, there were thousands of people all over the world praying for this guy. And it seems those prayers just hit the ceiling and didn't get to heaven. And over time, God showed me that through this tragedy, and it was a tragedy, is that in the end, every single person that prayed for Nabil was brought closer to God. So even in that very difficult instance where where we didn't seem to get what we wanted, in the end, we were brought closer into relationship with God. Philip Yancey is a well-known Christian writer, one of my favorite writers, and he helps us here with this quote. He says, In prayer, we present requests, sometimes repeatedly, and then put ourselves in a state to receive the result. We pray for God, what God wants to give us, which may turn out to be good gifts, or it may be the Holy Spirit. From God's viewpoint, there is no better response to persistent prayer than the gift of the Holy Spirit, God's own self. Like Peter, we may pray for food and get a lesson in racism. Like Paul, we may pray for healing and get humility. We may ask for relief from trials and instead get patience to bear them. We may pray for release from prison and instead get strength to redeem the time while there. Asking, seeking, and knocking does have an effect on God, as Jesus insists, but it also has a lasting effect on the asker, seeker, knocker. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, Paul wrote the Ephesians. 
Workmanship conveys rather clumsily the meaning of the Greek word poema, origin of the English word poem. We are God's work of art, Paul is saying. Of all people, Paul, with his history of beatings, prison, shipwreck, and riots, knew the travail involved in the fashioning of that art and the role that prayer played. Prayer offers an opportunity for God to remodel us, to chisel marble like a sculptor, touch up colors like an artist, edit words like a writer. The work continues until death, never perfected in this life. Church Father Augustine puts it like this, We pray that we may be constructed, not that God may be instructed. We pray that we may be constructed, not that God may be instructed. So prayer, more than anything else, teaches us who God is. And then in verses 11 to 13, Jesus has this little mini parable about, uh, about the character of God. In verses 11 to 13, it's this little story about um, when children ask for something and then parents not giving, what, not giving bad things, but giving good things. And then he, there's this bit of a puzzling thing. It says, even though you who are evil give good things. And I'm like, boy, fathers, mothers, parents, we're evil? That's a little harsh, Jesus. But the truth is, is that human beings estranged from God are not good. Often, if you went out on the street, we interviewed people, and we said, are people fundamentally good or fundamentally bad? People would say we're fundamentally good. But actually, that is not the teaching of the Bible. The teaching of the Bible is that the human condition in its natural state is not good. We are not born good. The Bible teaches us that we're born... My kids could lie before they could talk. They could nod a lie to me. From the fall of Adam and Eve, the human race has been infected by sin. 1 Kings 8.46, there is no one who does not sin. Psalm 143.2, no one living is righteous before you. And then David even points to sin residing within us, even in the womb. Psalm 51.5, surely I was sinful at birth sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And then Paul in Ephesians 2 says that by nature we are deserving of wrath. Sin is rebellion against God's law. It's missing the mark that God has set us to aim at. It is transgressing God's law. It's disobeying God's directives. It's offending God's purity. It's incurring guilt before God the judge. Sin is a continual negation of the call of God, and the root of all sin is pride. Sin is willful opposition to the authority of God in our life. And my favorite theologian defines it like this. Sin, can we, sin is a lack of conformity to the law of God in act, habit, attitude, outlook, disposition, motivation, and mode of existence. So in all these things, our actions, our habits, our attitudes, our outlooks, our dispositions, all of it does not conform to how God wills for us. You know, there's a theological description of sin called total depravity. You're probably like, whoa, hey, you know, I'm bad, but I'm not totally depraved. But that's not what it means. It means instead that there is no area of the human personality that is untouched by the effects of sin. It means that our minds, our hearts, our emotions, our wills, and our thoughts, that even our physical bodies have been touched by sin. And if every single part of us is bad, it shows us how it's impossible for us to save ourselves. We cannot earn God's favor unless God saves us. We are lost. And that's why Jesus says, look, even though you are evil, even though you have this predisposition towards sin— there's still enough of this common grace within you that God has put in you that if your child asks for something, you will give them that good gift. And in contrast, he said, if broken sinful humanity can do that, then how much more, how much more will your Father in heaven give? Give what? Good gifts? Yeah, in Matthew's description of this teaching, it's good gifts. But in this passage, we read, how much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? 
which now I think this links back to the ask, seek, or knock. It seems that Jesus is saying is that behind all of our requests, there is this primal desire, this primal need for the presence of God. He's saying that's the most important request. The fundamental need that we all have is the presence and power of God in our lives. Okay, I want to do something practical now and and teach you a tool that you can use in your prayer life. And to do that, we're going to, I'm going to get the ushers to pass out uh, just a text of Psalm 28. If you didn't get one, the ushers will come forward and hand these out so you have that in front of you. And so we're going to learn something called, it's just how to pray the Psalms. And it's something I've been doing for years. So if you need one, just raise your hand and we'll get, get you a copy. I think most people didn't pick one up on the way in. So we'll get a copy to you there. So if we can put Psalm 28 up there. So we have Psalm 28 up there. And so praying the Psalms is simply going through a Psalm, sort of slowly, line by line, reading it, and then pausing it, praying it back to God. So we're going to do that together this morning. So verse 1 of Psalm 28 says this, To you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. And right there, you can stop. And you can say, what does it mean that God is my rock? Where, where do I need security and a solid foundation in my life today? Are there areas that are challenging? Are there areas that are insecure? Where do I need God as a rock in my life? Then he says, if you remain silent, I will be like those who go down to the pit. And here's a, a point where you can get honest with God. And say, God, you are all I have in terms of this incredible challenge I am facing right now. I will go down to the pit if you do not help me. Verse 2, it says, Hear my cry for mercy. Hear me, God. I am crying. Look into the depths of my soul. See what I need. What am I crying out to you for? In verses 3 to 4, talk about the reality of evil in our world. And then you can pray, deliver me from evil. I need your divine protection to sustain me, to judge the evil that is in this world. And verse 5 is a cause for praise because it says, he will tear them down. Talking about evil people, he will tear them down and never build them up again. Thank you, God, that injustices will be rectified, that you are the perfect judge. Verse 6 is a shift from from petition to praise, which is a great way to conclude your praise. Lord, I praise be to the Lord, for you have heard my cry for mercy. Thank you, God, that this has not been an empty exercise. As I've been praying, you've been listening. The God of the universe has heard me. Lord, you are my strength and my shield. Lord, my life is so fragile, weak, and insecure. There are so many things out of my control. Lord, I thank you that you are my strength and my shield. And I choose to trust in you, that there's nothing in your creation that I can trust in, but I can trust in you. People will fail me, but you will never fail me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song I praise him. All of this is causing great joy to well up within me, Lord. Lord, you are not just my strength. It says here, the Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation. Lord, you're not just my strength. You're the strength of the church. And Lord, we live in difficult times where people are confused about who you are and what you want us to do. Lord, there are many forces coming against your church. We thank you that you are our strength, that you are our fortress. And the last line is this, save your people, bless your inheritance, be their shepherd, and carry them forever. That would be an amazing prayer for you to take out into your week, is to pray that God would shepherd this church, his church, Ebenezer Baptist Church. So that's a very quick kind of lesson in how to pray the Psalms. And I want to challenge you this year to start praying the Psalms. Start praying with, with Psalm 1 and just slowly move through it. It will take you maybe 5-10 minutes a day, and you will see a dramatic change in your spiritual life. Now, all this prayer, all this ability to prayer connect with God is predicated 
and what Jesus did for us on the cross. Because Jesus died on the cross, he opened up a way for sinful humanity to engage with a holy God. And so it's fitting that we conclude our time together with the act of communion. And I'll invite the worship team up. So communion is this act of worship where we remember Jesus' death on our behalf on the cross. And if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, you are welcome to join us this morning. And if you find yourself this morning as a seeker, as someone who's still journeying towards God, take this time to reflect and think and pray about where you're at with God. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven to 29 says, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body of the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Well, let's, let's take a few moments in silence to examine ourselves to repent if we need to repent, and then we'll partake together. So just do that, and then I'll, uh, I'll give some more instruction on how we're going to partake together. So we're going to conclude our sermon, or our service this morning, with some time actually in prayer. And this is not going to take a long time, but I think this is very important. So what we're going to do is we're going to have four areas of prayer that we're going to focus on. Family, church, education, and government. And as I said before, you can do this privately, you can do this silently on your own, or you could do it with the folks you came with, your family, or you could do it with the people around you uh, uh, as well. We're going to have a brief moment of prayer corporately like that, then I'll conclude each time. So we're going to move this, this pretty quickly. So let's move to the family slide. So in praying for family, we want to understand for a biblical definition of family in our culture. We want to pray for the healing of broken families the establishment of godly families in our city, help for parents to lead their homes according to godly principles, and then, of course, to pray for your own family. So let's pray together for a while, and then I'll, I'll move us to the next prayer focus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of the family. I pray for each of the families in our church here this morning. Lord, heal the families that are broken or that are strained, marriages that are in trouble, children that have walked away from you, Lord. Lord, you are a good, good father. You long to see families together. So I pray your spirit of healing to fall upon the families in our church this morning. Amen. All right, let's move to next slide church. So we're going to pray for our church. We're going to pray for Ebenezer Baptist. We're going to pray for discernment and wisdom for our board, unity of our church. We're going to pray for other churches in Saskatoon as you feel led. Pray for our denomination, the Baptist General Conference, and for the spread of the gospel across Canada. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this church, Ebenezer Baptist Church, for its long tenure of faithful ministry, Lord. May we continue to faithfully serve you in this place at this time, Lord. Establish your church in Canada as well, we pray. In your name, amen. All right, let's move on to education. And the last two that we're going to focus on are education and government. And one thing I've noticed is 
education and government take a lot of hits from a lot of people. And we often like to complain about education and government. But I think it's important for us as believers to be positive, to do positive things. And I think praying is a better response than right thing. So we're going to we're going to pray. We're going to pray for this coming school year. Pray for the public schools, the Catholic schools, the Christian private schools, the teachers, the principal, the administrators, the school board. And we want to pray for a radical transformation of the worldviews within the education system. Pray for the U of S, Sask Poly. Pray for your child's school. You can pray for uh, the minister of education there, Jeremy Cockrell. Let's pray together now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the education system. We thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to send our children to schools. But Lord, we know and we understand that the, the, the culture and the spirit right now in many educational systems are antithetical to you and to what you would have us believe. And so, Lord, we pray for a radical transformation and reformation in the educational systems in this land, Lord. We thank you for teachers who serve very sacrificially oftentimes we pray your blessing on them. And we pray for the schools represented here in this room and online, Lord, that this would be a great year of education for our children in your name. Finally, let's pray for the government. And this is something that's a command from Scripture to pray for our leaders. So let's pray for our prime minister, our premier, our mayor. And again, we want to see a radical transformation in the worldview of many of those in the political world and also the raising up of godly leaders into government. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you have instituted government for the common good, for the civil good, Lord. And you invite us into the process of, of just administration, Lord. And so, Lord, we pray at this time for our elected officials. We pray for Prime Minister Trudeau, for Mayor Scott Moe, or sorry, for Premier Scott Moe, for Mayor Charlie Clark, Lord. Uh, we thank you for each of these men, and we pray that you would bring advisors, godly advisors around them, and that they would lead out of hearts and minds renewed by you. We also pray that you would raise up godly uh, leaders to enter into civic politics, Lord, that would lead this country in a righteous way. We thank, pray all these things in your name. Amen. So I'll close our service. And... Heavenly Father, we thank you with what we have learned today of the importance of prayer, of how to pray, of the power of prayer. And Lord, we bring the Ramage family before you as we close out our time this morning. We thank you for Pat, for the life of faithful, sacrificial, and quiet service she lived her life with, Lord. She was a, a mighty warrior in your kingdom. And we know that she's receiving her reward now, but leaves behind a very broken and sad family. And so we pray for Ray, Ray and the boys, Lord, that in a supernatural way, they would sense the depth of your love and care for them, even as they mourn the death of a, a wife and a mother in the coming days. As a family, may we surround them in your love and walk with them and carry them through the coming difficult days. And Heavenly Father, I just pray for each person here, each person online, Lord, that you would draw them closer to you in the coming days, that they would walk in intimate fellowship with you, the living God. Pour out your blessing on each of them as we go out into this day and into our week. In your name we pray, amen.